We've heard the term trained professional or leave it to the experts. In fact, we've even seen shows on TV advertisements saying we fix what somebody tried to uh, fix themselves and broke or words to that effect. I even saw a couple weeks ago on the front plate, so to speak, of a truck uh, that um, he as a mechanic does the same thing. And there's even the term learned helplessness. Um, in a sense, perhaps, part of that being a sense of helplessness because we say we're not trained in it. Let's, let's call the approved solution in here. The exterminator of choice, shall we say. The, the problem solver of choice. Now I know, for instance, um, one reason I used to put off doing anything concerning plumbing or what have you, electrical work, uh, let's say on a fridge that I did a couple months ago, replacing an evaporative um, motor in the freezer compartment, is because I told myself, even if I tried to, I would make errors. And what's the point if you did solve it after three, four errors, or you bought the necessary tools, and um, you didn't have to do the job again for three, five, ten years, and you forgot it all, that the um, procedures, if you didn't write it down or review it, and you'd have to start the learning curve all over again. Why not just hire a trained professional? And yes, there's some economics to that notion then. Why, quote, reinvent the wheel in the sense of getting up to speed on something if you don't have the time or the tools? Time being a tool, by the way, of a sense. And the time to review it if it's just basically uneconomical to do this once every five years and having to retool your knowledge. Now some would say it just gives them a sense of pleasure to have tools in the garage and do the work themselves because they're not dependent on anyone else. But perhaps that's a different matter entirely. For we're all dependent on something, aren't we? We can't be, like Emerson talked of, self-reliant completely Aren't we all dependent upon our heart beating? We have no control of that. Aren't we dependent upon our not having a sudden stroke due to integrity of our blood vessels being strong? The notion then that we can be totally self-sufficient with a toolkit in the garage, doing everything on our cars ourselves and our house ourselves is rather fallacious because you probably are going to have a hard time controlling other matters. Even the statistics one p once put out that one in 600 people per year getting in a car is going to die from a car accident. And there's only so much you can do by driving a tank down the road, basically, and um, um, super-duper airbags and all the rest. <laughs> you uh, can't totally predict who might slam into you and uh, how that might mess up your day. But alternative to the notion or idea, what have you, to train professional. Leave it to the train professional. What about Marie Forleo in her book, uh, Everything is Figure Outable? That's an opposite approach, and that then counters learned helplessness, too, the whole notion. Of course, I would also put in then that if we have learned helplessness in part due to being told leave it to the professionals you can't do it yourself and secondly I love the uh, idea was it George Santayana the philosopher once having said those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it and Danny Iney I-N-Y a uh, writer of some books and notoriety in course content creation and learning theory talks of how our minds are like sieves and um, Piotr Wozniak in, Pol in Poland having created a profound software program about 30 years ago Super Memo which I availed myself of greatly uh, for learning 
at a very efficient level through spaced repetition using a computer. So George Santayana was it perhaps saying, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. Maybe thus as applied to learned helplessness, we can't seem to learn certain things if we don't write it down and review it quite a bit. One friend of mine taught by his father, for instance, in childhood, how to rebuild transmissions and engines, told me the secret of his learning process is he repeated everything to himself at least 20 times. Now here is a key point, I think, then, to the idea, concept, wording of trained professionals. Um, it seems to me from the athletic point of view, a person who is an athlete has training in certain skills, shall we say. But there being two types of skills or memories, those of a motor skill nature and those of a memory nature in the brain, knowledge-wise. Now, I think people have come up with certain terms in psychology, declarative memory versus motor memory. I'd have to look into that more. But the point being that if you learn something that's a skill like driving or riding a bicycle or shooting hoops, what have you, that these memories stick in you much longer once imprinted properly or strongly enough, as opposed to knowledge. We often don't realize this. So the trained professional who builds things brick by brick in an athletic endeavor, having perhaps in my mind a far, far, far different level of competency, oftentimes at top levels, than those who say they have built something brick by brick in um, matters that are much more shaky, much more ephemeral, much more um, subject to decay at a rapid rate than a longer rate. Call it the memory traces, for instance, if you will. In my mind, then, that's why we often so revere athletes at top levels, football, basketball, what have you. They've achieved phenomenal levels of of um, performance based on building things brick by brick in their in their area that retain uh, themselves. For instance, consider building a home um, brick by brick rather than prefab. You would hope the bricklayer uses mortar that stays put, such that when it rains, the whole thing doesn't wash away. Now, maybe Native American Indians or indigenous persons in general used to build homes out of clay, adobe. Maybe or maybe not, depending on the procedures, these did not hold up as well. You might call from a scriptural point of view in Christianity the building is something upon sand, and when a storm comes, it's washed away. Maybe memories learned in college or schooling even observation, um, not to slight observation, some say that's the greatest teacher, uh, are rather something much more shaky, subject to erosion, shall we say, than are things of an athletic nature, motor skill area. You might say thus too, what's learned in childhood sticks with you much better than things learned later on. I don't know quite why that might be. Maybe experience more intensely. Oh, here's another thing. Um, what about if you were to say getting an inoculation for COVID or a booster shot every once in a while or something for influenza, rubella, um, a variety of shots available now. What if um, you could call these, in a sense, training? Is the training thus only going to last a week? Or are we hoping it's going to last a few years or ten years, and then maybe you get a booster shot? Well, what is the procedure 
of booster shots for academic knowledge, for knowledge in the brain, as opposed to motor skill knowledge. How often do you need a booster shot in terms of review for knowledge you get in college? Now, in coffee shops and in classroom experience of my own, my not having a college degree, by the way, but a lot of classroom experience, I would say the phrase um, speck and dump came up by one group of people. You learn everything to perfection, and then you dump it and go on to the next material the next week. And in a coffee shop a couple of years ago with a number of college um, students at the professional level, it's called, say, um, one person talking about pharmacy studies in pharmacy school, they said what they studied was gone almost instantly, like in a week. And uh, you simply were putting stuff down on an exam and then moving on, and you couldn't remember it afterward. Is that then training if it doesn't persist because would you call it an inoculation for COVID if it only lasted a week or um, as per any other shot? You'd want it to last more than a week and having to go back each week for a booster shot. What kind of training would that be? And yet we want to say training from a college where it is never urged or allowed, basically, time for review and constant review, unless you're using software to do it with and you apply it, you apply yourself to it. Um, From enough people I've talked to, without constant review, it's like pouring water through a sieve or into a bucket that has holes in the bottom. The whole concept of claiming you're getting trained in the sense of getting training from an um, inoculation for some disease or other it seems rather um, questionable in my mind. If uh, the training or instruction or inoculation has a life or half-life of only a week or two, what kind of training is that? Now, some would say on the professional level, if you were to say word professional or trained professional level, well, we have years and decades of um, clinical experience that actually increase our level or that we go to continuing education classes. Now, I'm not going to get into particulars of my views on these two claims, but to my mind, this is not really building upon what was quote-unquote taught in college is the fundamentals, if you will, let alone um, whether there's another factor involved in the so-called trained professional approach, and that is, is there is there too much training in the sense of too many viewpoints put out there? I have a book, for instance, on my desk. The title is Data Smog. For instance, some... Um, when you go to college, if you go to college, you have certain preformed ideas about the world and how best to be happy as to how you were brought up. If you're luckier, maybe a lot of those ideas were somewhat sound. But then you go to college and you get a panoply of ideas from various professors, various students, and various um other trained professionals earlier who have books out and theories. So if you study psychology, for instance, you will study the theories of, say, 20, 30 great psychologists, as it's called. Can that be data smog, then? And you come out confused as ever. You don't know which way is up and which way is down. And you didn't have the time even to parse through it all and you have increasing levels of doubt in general from all this data smog, when when you went in, you had certain viewpoints that might have been more sound in general. Now your thinking is quite muddied, if not skewed more toward money and short-term expediency even, and other values that maybe your parents didn't consider so hot to treat and uh, teach. So to recap so far, is it training 
And should we call someone a trained professional if it's basically in one ear and out the other because it doesn't stick and it isn't reviewed? And secondly, is it training if the material is so complex, has so many different viewpoints to it, often skewed even as to whether it's even beneficial in the long term. Uh, for instance, if only the Hollywood approach, pluses and minuses, were taught in a college, arguably some say that is. And if only a certain religious view were taught, or a money view only, or a fame approach, uh, an escapist approach, is that a rather skewed approach right there too? Uh, so that's the third factor there uh, in the service of what? But the second is um, to reiterate, um, is it too much data smog such that you come out not knowing uh, what's staring you right in the face or what you were trained up as um, when you were a child up to age 18? Can you come out so confused you don't know what's up and down? Case in point, Many say Georgia O'Keeffe was the greatest female artist of the 20th century. When asked what was the secret of her success, she said simply this, I unlearned everything I was taught in art school. I might add, though, she was given extraordinary, um, extraordinary freedoms in art school that other students didn't get as per uh, doing her own thing. Uh, as per uh, unguided um, unguidedness, so she had less arguably to unlearn than other art students. Yet she even said that she unlearned so much. That's the secret of her success. But who even has the time to unlearn? The more you learn, perhaps from a variety of viewpoints, data smog training, if you will, the more difficult it is. The more confused we get even to the point of my next major contention. Are you a trained professional if the word set you get in the training is loaded with words that are often toxic, as I call them, in terms of respect toward others, such that many of the words you're taught might be filled with blame or hate? Is that then training if the word set you come out with is that manner? let alone the words skewed again towards the Hollywood approach, the escapist approach all too often, or the fame approach, what have you, the short-term expediency approach, as per drug of choice, shall we say. And is it training if you are trained to provide services only in areas that are measurable? For instance, is it only considered um, a service to offer if your service is helping people make money or get a certain form of power often again through money is it thus training to not train someone in the intangibles hence why even there are religious colleges arguably versus non-religious or secular colleges. I would say, though, religious colleges can be skewed just as much as the, quote, secular college. In fact, the secular college, some would say, is a religious college itself. Is there a woman, Coulter, who came out with a book on um, certain things being um, a religion? And some would say atheism is a religion of itself although I don't like to use the word atheist, I think it's a rather toxic term, derogatory. So, those going to a religious college might say, well, we prefer training that um, helps people have empathy or love or understanding or values. But my question is, um, oftentimes, is that really happening, or is it religious training with uh, the caveat that uh, you make quite a bit of money? The prosperity religious training approach. For how many 
programs of instruction in colleges today are in simply uh, a PhD in love where uh, for instance Leo Bascalia preached or taught Love 101 in class at University of Southern California the extent to which he succeeded in the core concepts or not I'm not so sure I have my reservations but at any rate he believes we need to learn about love uh, whereas many religious colleges train people in how to make money uh, and then say well also we train you in love understanding compassion and values but how you get that money at high levels could be in conflict often uh, with how you're teaching values in the first place I'd also say maybe we need a third approach if we're going to call certain colleges or even schools before college secular and others religious how about a third type of college the spiritual based college some saying there's no comparison apples and oranges between talking religion versus spirituality maybe we need spiritual colleges not just religious based colleges or even values based colleges some say spirituality goes far beyond what we call matters of values even yet another point how many programs of instruction in the liberal arts as we call it typically people oriented areas and why call it arts uh, some call it soft science but why is there so little requirement basically for mathematics in the liberal arts and then people coming out and saying they're trained and trained professionals hence leave it to the professionals or even uh, if you're not a trained professional in the people areas called training in liberal arts you're an armchair philosopher or um, you're an alternative medicine practitioner you're an amateur you're going by the seat of your pants you're too intuitional you're not scientific you don't have a broad spectrum view of what has come before as studied by um, and taught through the greatest 50 philosophers or experts in liberal arts field uh, but of course from the data smog um, problem many of the greatest empathetic people who led great movements in my mind were um, the most mathematically or technically skilled even um, in foreign countries uh, Russia Boris Yeltsin was an engineer and um, Andrei Sakharov from Russia a dissident was a nuclear physicist or scientist a John Brown one of the greatest Buddhist leaders studied theoretical physics at Cambridge uh, Pima considered one of the top uh, Buddhists out of Berkeley arguably you don't get to Berkeley unless you know kind, kind of a little bit more than average mathematics more than just punching numbers in a calculator and finally the great philosopher Schopenhauer strongly pushing observation mathematics and linguistics again linguistics as I pointed out uh, talking of earlier in this um, as per um, our words and what is um, taught in the words themselves not just a word but a whole set of concepts in one word Schopenhauer tried to wrap that all up in one neat package and although I think he had some off-base ideas and uh, was somewhat anger laden perhaps had uh, a lot to say here now there are some too who would say if you don't um, derive experience from something that is very going to give you very tangible feedback like a farmer uh, whether of um, crops or animals in a sense or um, 
building something like a home, carpentry, how are you going to learn something strong as per feedback? Also, the Actors Guild show had a... Um, there was a show by the Actors Guild on YouTube I watched a week ago featuring a biography on Harrison Ford, and he was on the show. He was talked of as one of the greatest actors ever in terms of acclaim and box office finance draw, what have you. He said a great secret to his acting success is that for many years he took a hiatus and was a carpenter, albeit a carpenter to the stars, but you could argue he got so much tangible feedback. Whereas what is the opposite? Perhaps what I call a wordsmith career in which all too often much is written that isn't worth the paper it's written on, some people would say. Or it is a, a bunch of data smog or word salads. And if a therapist, say, or analyst, isn't strongly trained in mathematics and pointing it in the right direction, too, as per motivation, well then, who is to say that outcomes from therapy, if not advantageous, and in my mind, typically aren't, what if then we are going to say that um, the negative outcomes can be shifted or blame shifted as um, simply due to bad genetics in the person or maybe uh, they're being in an environment that's too toxic that they couldn't get out of or even the claim well they had a diagnosis so bad what do you expect when they committed suicide or finally the adage of um, it's just an art form anyway that even applying, say, to medicine. When something doesn't turn out well in medicine in general, maybe um, the adage is, well, what do you expect? It's, it, medicine is an art, not a science completely. Or the liberal arts people will say it's a soft science. But then, why is there a video on um, Ben Carson, the great surgeon, brain surgeon, gifted hands, why is he so considered hands down the most gifted surgeon in terms of brain surgery before he left that uh, that field? Uh, you wouldn't want to go to someone who studied at Podunk University brain surgery compared to Ben Carson. Universally acclaimed, probably one of the top if not best brain surgeon. So, if you went and saw a brain surgeon from Podunk University or Antarctica University and it didn't turn out so well and the physician told the relatives, the surviving people, well, medicine is just an art form. Are you going to be so happy when you had to settle for brain surgery from a graduate of Antarctica University versus Ben Carson and only to be told well it's just an art form I think Ben Carson was practicing a little more than art finally I'd say one last thing if we're talking something in the liberal arts concerning people I don't think it's necessarily um an all-or-nothing thing as to whether the person went to school at Barefoot University or Bubblegum University or Antarctica University in a people field uh, when we're talking two different things here. What level of empathy and intuition and observation are involved? Many going to Barefoot University perhaps arguably having much more training and upbringing and empathy and observation as opposed to those from Harvard or Caltech or MIT or what have you, Yale more often maybe or Princeton in the people area. So um, those individuals much more technocratic of a sort you might say, much more detail oriented, much less empathetic and observational oriented 
religious oriented, whatever have you. So it's not uh, exactly all or nothing. But on the other hand, maybe Antarctica University isn't pushing mathematics, pushing complexity understanding. Don't we have to have both then? Uh, complexity understanding and empathy and uh, what they would call values, I hope the right values. Uh, don't we have to have as part of our training package too then a minimum of escapism, drugs of choice, and lots of responsibility thus, taking responsibility. That's why some of the greatest leaders ever coming out of small villages, out of nowhere, even Ramanujan, one of the top mathematicians ever, where, ever coming out of a, a small village, living in a hut in India with no college training. And his understanding of where his ideas came from, basically, um, from sources he could not point a finger on. Noting, by the way, when he linked up with Hardy in England at Cambridge University, Hardy pushed him much more as an atheist, Hardy, to um, be much more rigorous, develop many more proofs, complaining all the time that uh, Ramanya John was too basically spiritual or intuitive as to his source. They tried to uh, meld the two together. But what good is melding both together if the results don't stick. So, and you would hope that it's directed in the right end, too. Long-term versus short-term expediency. Now, that's then rather a complex view, but those are my thoughts in verbal form right now. On my thoughts on trained professionals, learned helplessness, and why sports is often so revered Perhaps it's not just because we tend to enjoy getting our frustrations out, some of us anyway, by seeing others clubbed almost to death on the on the um, arena, the sports arena. Maybe there's more to it than that. We enjoy seeing an impeccable level of um, skill, often typically not found in the liberal arts areas, if you will, because the learning process involved is completely different. What is learned is much more brick by brick. It persists. Motor skills versus what is learned in college is all too often a smattering and something that's basically termed in one ear and out the other in within a short period of a week. Who would want, once again, inoculations, even for COVID, if you uh, believe they're effective vaccinations, um, if it's only going to last a week? Who wants even a polio shot that will only have an effectiveness of one week and you have to get the same polio shot over and over and over and over again at considerable expense financially and time-wise? Who wants that kind of a polio shot and then claim it's training against polio? Is that training? <laughs> 